Thank you. Okay, um, I want to welcome you back to, uh, on the second segment of the um, of this seminar. Yes, sir. So when, when you asked us that question and we so when you asked the question and we completed the answer on that piece of paper, what was your question again? Can you give us reason or reasons, if any, of why you chose um, whoever you married or who you intended to marry or whatever be the situation. Give us the reason why you made the choice you did, if there is any reason. So, so was that a trick, a trick question? <laughs> No, you see, it, it wasn't a trick question. It is a true question because it brings an unconscious mind some of the decisions that we make. Remember at the beginning when I made some key statements, I said consequences are more important than the decisions that we make. And the reason I said that is this. Sometimes unknown to us, we have things we never considered as conditions in making a choice. And when we make those choices, if you look at every relationship that is having problem now, majority of them, some of their expectations or as their expectations are not met. And some of them could be that the person was X, Y, Z. Now the person is no more that person. The person was kind. Now certain conditions have made you believe she is no more kind. So those things that you saw that attracted you some of those things are not there anymore, and what do you want to do? Like you said, you need for the exit door, or the condition of love changes. So it was not a trick question. It was a, it was a question to bring out, especially to help us. You see, it, it, the, the reason why sometimes I do this overseas is this. 99.9% .9 of the people do not know me. So when you are speaking, it doesn't seem too personal with the people you know. You're speaking directly what God wants you to speak. But that's why I said at the beginning, if we follow the four criterion that must be necessary to seek for the truth, our lives will be changed. Our lives will be changed. So it was not a trick question. It was a question to help us, even for the ones here who may not be married, who are considering marriage, for them to be careful in creating conditions of service. Because when those conditions of service are not there anymore, it becomes a bigger problem. But again, I said, one of the ways to avoid future problems, if you don't want to go to mechanic every day, you buy a brand new vehicle. So you choose right from the beginning to avoid future problems. But if you already made a choice at the time and you felt it was a good choice, now I'm telling you, it is still a good choice, only that you were looking for a finished product and you got a raw material. And if you have a raw material with you and it keeps staying there all over continuously, and if nothing is done to improve that raw material, it will look as if it's of no value to you. But now we're about to... You got any other question before I go? Go ahead. I said, if any... <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yours is a very unusual case. <laughs> 
It's very unusual. But anyway, that's... <laughs> All right, so now let's step in into some of these principles. And one of the first principles we're going to look at, and I want you to relate all this to relationship. It is very, very important. If we can't tie this together, uh, many of us will be lost. Now, one of the first things we have to look at is the principle of creation. When God decided to create the world, the earth, when he decided to create the earth, God has one simple principle. And the reason also we call them principle is this. It came from the word prince, which means first. Okay? And God's intention was to put man on earth so that he can colonize the earth with man and still undertake his rulership from heaven. I'm going to explain that because every time we talk about kingdom, kingdom, many of you Americans do not understand what we mean when we say kingdom. It's not that you're not educated enough to understand, but you are never a partaker of a kingdom. And now, for me, I was born in Nigeria. Nigeria was sometime in the past a colony of Britain. And because the British colonized Nigeria, the, the, the Nigeria became a colony of the British. The same thing, God who is in heaven decided he wants to establish an earth. He put a, the established earth and he needed man to be on earth. His desire and his intent was to use the male man and the female man to be the ones he will use to colonize the earth. Now, I'm going to put a parallel uh, uh, analysis here between Nigeria being colonized by the British. The very first thing that the British did when they colonized Nigeria was to affects and affect our culture. Our culture in Nigeria changed. Our culture became British culture. The, one of the first things they did in driving, we used to drive on the right side like Americans. The first thing the British did, they changed the driving. We, now, we were now driving at the left side. The next thing they did is that you see a lot of Nigerians and people that came from Nigeria newly before they became caffeinated were drinking tea. The British drink tea three, four times a day. You see people in Nigeria drink tea. We can drink tea in the morning. We can drink tea in the afternoon. We can drink tea in the evening because our culture was being affected by the British. And the next thing they did was our language. They affected our language and made English a lingua franca. So English became the general spoken language, despite we have over 200 languages in Nigeria. They made a central language. So put that in the same line with God's desire to colonize the earth. And when he put man on earth and... Uh, Give man the instruction on how to carry on on the earth. <clears throat> Jesus exemplified it when the disciples asked him to teach them how to pray. The disciples asked him to teach us how to pray. Our Lord Jesus Christ gave them a template of prayer. For many of you who are computer savvy, when you buy your computer, there's a template of certain things in it. Today, what we do mistakenly, we pray the same template back to God. The template is just to give you a format on which you can do what? Form other things there. But it's not for you to go back to the computer and print the template back to the manufacturer. That's not it. The template is to give us a guide on how to add more things. So he gave them a sample of God's intent when he says, Our Father who art in heaven, you know, hallowed be thy name. The next one, he said what? Thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. 
that's giving us an understanding that God's desire, as Christ was teaching us, is to bring the same kind of rulership that God had in heaven on earth, but using men to carry out that rulership. And one of the things we have mistakenly taught in the past, or we have been taught, is when they talk about the issue of the world and the earth. When the scripture is talking about the world, it's not talking about the secular world. It's talking about the elements that control the things on earth, like education, like media. Like if you notice that people who have the great influence on people are those who are in the media, those who are in education. So there are seven pillars of the world, and those seven pillars, he wanted the believers, even Jesus said, go you into the world. He said, you are not of the world, you know, you are in the world, but you are not of the world. Go in there, let us use the kingdom principles to affect every place where we are. Today, people call it marketplace ministry. But when they're talking about marketplace, they're talking more about marketplace in which they propagate the church. But it's about the kingdom. If you, are an, if, you, if, you, if you are an economist or if you're a nurse or if you're a doctor, you're an accountant, whatever you are, the way you perform by the power of the spirit of excellence of the kingdom, they will see a difference. You affect the place where you are with the culture of heaven. Now bringing it to uh, using Nigeria as an example. The scripture is understood, everything on the Bible, if you can understand it under the concept of the kingdom, you can get a good interpretation of the scripture. Because all the scripture is about, it's about a king. It's about dominion. It's about royal family. Now, what I'm talking about is that for so many people who may not understand, Saudi Arabia is called the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. In America here, you guys operate under democracy. Democracy, the people makes the law. In the kingdom, the king alone makes the law. In the kingdom, the king takes care of the people. In America, the people decide what happens to them. The people can change the law. Because you are in a democracy. In America, you can elect the government. In the kingdom, the government cannot be changed. In the kingdom, you are a prince or you are a princess. You are never up to the point of a king because the only way a king can become, a prince can become a king is after the death of the king. But... Surprisingly, our own king never dies. Therefore, in order for God to make you kings, he moved us up from heaven to earth in a distant place. It's the same thing that happened in Europe. If you look at how Brazil and other Latin American countries was colonized, before Christopher Columbus was sent out, we all know about the king. And the king sent out Christopher Columbus when he colonized so many of the places and stuff like that. He ended up sending his son out who became the king in Brazil. As far as the father, the king was alive, he was a prince. He could never be king until his father dies. Therefore, his father sent him out. He became the king in Brazil. When he goes back to where his father is, he becomes what? A prince. When he go back to the distant country, he become what? The king. Therefore, God's desire for us is to follow the principles of creation in relationship. And one of the very first key things you're going to see is what is called a source and sustainer. In Genesis chapter 1, the scripture showed up from Genesis chapter 1 all the way down to the end of, the, uh, of, of chapter 1. There are certain things you will understand. It talks about the creation. Genesis chapter 2 tells us how God did it. Now, this is very critical. This is where the key point now begins. In Genesis chapter 2, 
In Genesis chapter 1, if you go from verse 11, there is something I call the source and sustainer you know, principle, which means everything that comes out of something is sustained by where it came out from. In Genesis chapter 1, when you begin to go from verse 21, even from, from verse 21, you will see that the Bible says that God caused uh, vegetation to grow. All kinds of plants bearing seed and some fruits in them, all of them came from the ground. He went further, he talked about the fish. Came out, you know, in the sea. There were a lot of sea uh, animals and creatures and the fish in the sea. He went further, he talks about the sky, the air. He talks about the birds flying in the air where God wants them to be. He went further all the way down to verse 26. But one of the things you're going to understand on the principle of source and sustainer is that God was replicating himself from Genesis 1. Now, I will explain to you. When you get to verse 21, it talks about the vegetations and the animals and all those things that came out of from the ground. If the trees are to come out of ground, therefore, in order for the trees to remain alive, it must be attached to where it came out from. If you uproot the tree today and put it outside without planting it back to the earth, what happens to it? It dies. The next thing he talks about the fish and all the sea creatures that he talked about that they would be in the sea. When you take a fish, <coughs> excuse me, when you take a fish out of the sea and put it on the ground and feed the fish with all kinds of things, what happens to the fish? It will die. Because the source of anything must be the sustainer of that same thing. We get that. So he went further to talk about the animals. The animals that say they're going to be on the land. If you take the land animals and throw them in the middle of the sea, what happens? They will die. And then that's the, that's the principle of source and sustainer. It talks about the light that will give light, the big one, the smaller one, moon and the stars, when they fall out of their place in the sky, what happens? They become what? A meteorite. And when they become a meteorite, what happens? They crash and do what? Die. Everything must be sustained. And then when it got to Genesis 1.26, now we're going into the real step right now on the principle of source and sustainership. When he got into Genesis 1.26, God said, let us Make man in our own image. What do you mean by in our own image? Let us make man in our own characteristics. Let us make man that will possess the same characteristics as God. In our own image and in our own likeness. That means it, that possess the same ability and capability of God. Watch carefully the translations of those words. First one, let us make man that has the same character, the characteristics of God. Let us replicate that. Then in our own likeness is let us make man that possess the same capabilities and abilities as God. Now, it says in that verse 26, let us make man in our own image. And he said, and in the image of God, he created he, him, male and female. Now, on verse 26, there is something very important there. If you go back to that verse 20, he said, well, after he said, let us make man, can somebody read that? Because there's something here, if you miss it, you will miss the essence of relationship on earth. Anybody has a Bible, Genesis 1, 26. Can you read it for us? We have a, a microphone. Genesis 1, 26, go ahead. So that they may rule over the fish. Okay, hold on one second. I want you to read, let us make man in our own image. When you get to the so that, stop. Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they... So that. That's it. So that. Let us make man in our likeness and our image, so that. The essence of God 
creating man is the next sentence that he's about to read. So that. Every other thing you are successful in, if you are not successful in the so that, you miss the purpose for which you were created. And if you miss that, you're going to miss the essence of relationship. And I want you to understand, as I step back a little bit, concerning the issue of source and sustainership. As we go further, we're going to get to chapter 2. You're going to understand something there. As the fish is sustained by the water, the, uh, um, the, 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 the trees are sustained by the earth, you also understand that God did not form Eve, the female, from the dust. He did one job with the dust, and that's the male. Where did the woman come from? From the man. Therefore, it is easy for them. I hear many of you call your wives babe. If you're calling her babe, that means you also have to do what? Sustain her. If she comes out from man, that means the source and sustainership of the woman is also the what? The man. I know many of us are shocked. Many of us are surprised with that. Because when God said, when God created us out of him, our own sustainership is in what? Is in God. When we detach from God, what happens? We die. Therefore, the woman was taken out of man so that man becomes the source and the sustainer of man. We will go into that when we get to that place and I'll explain better. Now, but I'll let you to understand where he says here now that let us make man in our own image and in our likeness so that so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals. So that they will rule. The word there is the rule. So that they will have dominion. So that they will have control. Therefore, God's intent was to establish man on earth to take dominion, to take control of the nature of the earth. And when man fell, man did not fall from heaven. I want you to understand that. Man fell from the dominion. Every other thing man was able to do, but man don't have the dominion over the earth anymore. We cannot command the sick to be healed. We cannot ask the daylight to become night. The power and the characteristics that makes man God, we lost it when man fell. He says so that. Now, this is important because as we are notching into the main thing today, talking about relationship, you will see how the relationship between the earth and the trees, the relationship between the sea and the fish, the relationship between the air and the birds, the relationship between uh, the sun, the moon, and the earth their responsibilities and what God put them into. And when each and every one of them move out of their source, they cannot be sustained anymore. They die. When you move out of the kingdom principles that God established in a relationship form with you, what happens to you? You die. You could be a living corpse. So today, many men have lost the understanding of our connectivity and our source and the importance of why we are called who we are. Now, after the issue of the so that, I want to deal with something very, very important here. We have been taught all the time and told and have read in different places. How many of you have read that man is the head? Many of you. Many of we have read that man is the head. But it is a mistake when we think because man is the head, we think that man is on the top. Man is not on the top. This will shock you. Man is not on the top. Man is the male figure, the male man is not at the top but at the bottom. And I know you wonder, why would you say because the Bible says we are the head? 
Where is the head of this building? Hmm? The head of this building is the foundation. So why will the head, man being the head, be on the top? The foundation is the strongest part of any building. The man is at the bottom because he is the one that carries the weight of the family. The reason why man is called a husband is from two Latin words, house and bond. Put together is called house bond. It is the man that bonds the house together. He is the one that bonds the house together. He is not the one that, that, that is on the top. He is at the bottom. The man may not be seen, but the effect is felt 24-7 at home. Without the foundation, the building cannot stand. To fix the foundation is very, very expensive. For many of you who happen to be in construction, you know that it is cheaper to fix the walls, cheaper to fix the ceiling, cheaper to fix the roof, but it is more expensive to fix what? The foundation. That is why it's more difficult to get men to the understanding of where and who God have called them to be. But the devil knows it and he will use every trick in life to deny men coming to feed to be strengthened in the inner man. He will use every tactics. He will use every ploy. He will use everything possible. Flat tires, heart attack, whatever it is, and all these things are fake to deny you the opportunity to feed the world that will strengthen you in the inner man. You fail in your relationship, you are a failure. That's the absolute truth. The condition of your life and of your entire family is a reflection of your success or your failure in managing the home. The home is the biggest task any man is given. And your home, if you're a pastor, you're a bishop, reverend, your home is your first congregation. If your children are unable to listen to your preaching, then you have no right preaching to anybody else outside. That's why the Bible talks about if any man aspires the position of a deacon, elder, whatever, or pope or bishop in the church, that he should feel first rule his own home what diligently. That if you're unable to rule and organize your home, how would you want to organize other people? And we know that the, the, the church is a reflection of the conditions of the family. I'll give you one example. Brother Victor, one second. Can I see you there, please? You come up, please. Let me have the four wonderful men in the front, please. Let me come here. I want to show you something right now. You're not messed up. We're just giving an analysis. <laughs> now, uh, come on, young man. Okay, you are the pastor. Yeah, stand here. Let me have another pastor, please. You, come on. Now, le let me show you something we many pastors deal with every day in the church. Yes, stand here. These are two pastors that run two different churches. Now, family number one is a messed up family. Family number two is a messed up family. The pastor himself is messed up. Two of you go and worship with him. <laughs> you have three because this is the families. It is the families that come together in the church. So the condition of their families is what they bring to the church. Now look at these two families. If this family is good and working fine in his family, following the principles and the laws of God. This family is doing the same thing, and this pastor is the same thing. When these two people go here to worship and deal with this pastor, the load of this pastor is less than the challenge. Why? Because the two of them 
in the church right now is a reflection of the condition of their homes. Now, when you take the congregation, the members of the church, and bring them into the society, it is the same condition that you have at home that follow them to the church. The same condition that follow them from the church will follow them to the society. And when you bring them the same thing to the state, it is the same mess of people that are there. But if you are able to get the families situated following the laws and the principles of God, then they begin to affect the people in the church. Then the people in the church will affect the society. Then the society will affect the entire nation. But the people in the society right now is actually finding solutions to their problems more than people in the church. In the Washington Post, it mentioned that the greatest number of divorce today is among, quote and unquote, Christians. Why should it be so? Thank you so much, my brother. Thank you. <laughs> Why should it be so? So as we follow the principles of creation, and we'll now come to the issue of the source and sustainership, now this is the key point I want you to understand. In order for our relationship to be very, very effective the way we desire it to be, every man who desires his relationship to be in place in an excellent form must first obey those rules for himself. Don't expect your girlfriend, don't expect your wife, don't expect your fiancé to obey the rules of the kingdom that you are not keeping. Let me give you the five points that must be in place in your life if you are not married even before you begin to seek marriage. If you are married, you must return to these five key points. Um, I've just been informed that your, your lunch is ready. <laughs> these five key points. Now let's go quickly to Genesis chapter 2 from verse 15. The Bible says, uh, do we have another uh, microphone please? So, uh, so he can just read us Genesis chapter 2 verse 15. Let us explain something very critical in this place now before we move on. Go ahead in Genesis 2.15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it. Okay, could you hold on one second? And also in the principles of creation, I want you to see the changes that took place only after relationship was established. From Genesis chapter 1 from verse 1, everything you say there, it will say, and God said, and God said, but from Genesis 1, 26, from the moment God said, let us, he spoke to himself, let us make man in our own image. From the next verse, it becomes, and the Lord God said. There was an introduction of the word Lord. That introduction of the word Lord begins the establishment of the relationship. And this is where it is very, very important. You miss this, you miss the whole thing. And if you notice in Genesis chapter 3, when the devil met Eve, he said to Eve, did God really say he removed the word Lord? From the moment relationship was introduced, the word Lord became the prominent and preeminent name. The tag in the relationship. And he said, And the Lord God took the man that he had created and put in the Garden of Eden. I want us to see something. The word Eden is a complicated word. It means many things at the same time. The word Eden means presence of God. It means <coughs> spot. It means a delightful spot. It means moment. It means open doors. So you see that God took man and put him in a delightful place at the moment with an open doors to heaven. That's my own summary. He put man in that place. And when the word put was translated, 
The word translated to put simply means he made man a place to habit in his presence. So the place of Adam's habitation was in the presence of God. These are key principles of relationship I want you to understand if you have to know about the kingdom. I'm not talking about church. I'm not talking about religion. I'm not talking about anything else but about the kingdom. These are principles. The very first thing, a man, before you even begin to seek for a wife, or even if you have a wife right now, and you are having challenges in your relationship, or you are not having challenges at all, you have to ask yourself, at this moment, am I in the presence of God? Am I dwelling and habiting, inhabiting in the presence of God? Am I in a delightful place in the presence of God? He put Adam in a delightful place at the moment, in a spot in his own presence. You cannot expect your wife or your spouse or your girlfriend or the person you intend to marry to be in the presence of God when you, that is the man that should be in charge as the foundation. It is how the foundation is laid. That's how the walls will be. Many times, many of us that are in construction have been to houses that have so many cracks on the wall. We were paid, we patched the walls and all those things and a couple of weeks down the line, the person called you back and said, man, I paid you X amount of money and you patched all this wall, you painted it. I see the cracks. So many cracks. In fact, it's worse. You don't know what you're doing. You don't need to do anything. You need to refund me my money. And then you go back a second time. You say, okay, we're going to get it right this time. You can put all the mud you want, all the stuff, and texture it, and do the heavy hand texture, and paint, and make sure everything is okay. A couple of months down the line, it shows up again. This time now, it comes with his brothers and sisters. It not only crack, the doors now will refuse to close, the windows now will be, you know, disaligned. It doesn't matter how many times that we go to fix it. The person might even get to a time they don't want you to come back to the house anymore. They might call two or three contractors and probably the fourth person will come and say, Sir, you don't have a problem with your walls. You need to call the foundation company. Why would they call foundation? And many times the homeowners will question, what has foundation got to do with the cracks? But the truth is that because there is a problem in the foundation, the cracks will continue to show. So it doesn't matter how many times we go for counseling and stuff like that until we return back to the foundation to fix the problem once and for all, then the cracks will stop appearing. So he put man in his presence. So you must make sure that you find yourself in the presence of God and that's where you can be in order to begin to attend to what God has put you to do. And the next verse that he said, he put the man in the garden to do what? To tend and to protect. Another translation to, to guard it. But I want you to see the word translated to tend also is a complicated word like the word Eden. It means pay attention to details. It also means to become. He put Adam in the garden to become. To become what? He put Adam in the garden. Another translation calls it, in Latin says, is to cultivate. So I want to tell you today, as a man, I began to wonder, why will God put Adam in, quote and unquote, a garden? Why didn't God make Adam a hunter? Why didn't Adam become a fisherman? Why didn't he give Adam other things except putting him in the garden? And I'm going to tell you something today. Until you get the understanding and the skills necessary to be a gardener, you will never learn to cultivate your family properly. 
until you learn every skill necessary to be a gardener. And I see people who are gardeners. They are very passionate about the gardening. If the winter is about to come up and they are within, um, it starts getting cold towards December, many of them begin to look for things to protect in the garden. They buy, I see some, I don't know whether they are clothing or plastic or different kinds of things to protect the garden. If you have to deal in your relationship to many of you here who have been married for a long time, you will know that one of the first skill you need in marriage is what? Patience. Is that correct? You need patience. To so many people, they want a quick fix. And many of you who understand gardening, you know that when you plant today, you can reap today. There is a process. Another thing you have to understand in gardening, you must know when to what? Plant. Many people who do gardening, they know when to fertilize. They know when to weed. They know when to water. All these things are skills that God put Adam to become. At this moment, there was no woman, there was no wife. We as men have to understand that the absence of men in the society have decimated our culture. Our race is decimated in so many aspects because of the absence of the male figure. And the male that we have today have not come to rediscover what it means to be a male figure. All they know is that being a man and having sex. That's all they need. That doesn't make you a source and a sustainer. How many of us can tell me about a couple of other skills you need or some of the things that will make you a good gardener? What are the things, what are the qualities of a good gardener? Can somebody tell me? Qualities of a good gardener. You have to know one to water, huh? Understanding the weather. You must understand. Remember sometimes you look at the women, it looks as if they call it what? Mood swings? Okay. <laughs> The mood swings. So you have to understand the weather. You have to understand the changes. And the truth is that the scripture, the woman is the only thing other than the Bible in the book of Ephesians that the Bible says that you should study and know your wife. That's the only other one. Study to know your wife. When you study to know her, you will be able to deal with the situation. You will know the weather. Okay, what else? You got to know what you're doing. <laughs> you have to love what you're doing. That's, I like that. You have to love what you're doing. You can't just be dealing with your wife or the woman you want to marry for the sake of it. Your interest must be really there. What else? Patience. You must be patient. You must be patient. <laughs> because without patience... <laughs> I know, I know, yes, you're married, huh? I know your patience has been tried, huh? <laughs> what else? Go ahead. You talked about creation. Yes, sir. And I uh, heard you, you mentioned that uh, man, that that God created man from the dust, and the woman was not from the dust, that the woman was from the side. So somehow, it's logical, I, I'm, I'm thinking aloud. So I, Go ahead, go ahead. So it's like, you created somebody, the scripture said he was put to, uh, to sleep, mm -hmm. and a rib, so uh, 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 a rib cannot make a whole bone part of a woman. Mm -hmm. So that means the woman was also formed the same dust so it was confusing but you know <laughs> like I, I like to put in a layman's language that okay. they created her but God made us understand that there's a uniformity of connection between the man and the woman okay I like
question and um, I'm going to attempt to answer it. That I, I use the word attempt because it might not be very satisfactory. From the little understanding I have come to know, I, uh, I have a question? Oh, okay. Give him a, okay. Give him. He want to answer the question. Thank you so much. No problem. Uh, thank you, Pastor. Uh, so, I guess the misunderstanding there is the word man, right? Um, so, when the Bible says man in his own image, right? He wasn't talking about a male figure, like a like me as a male. The spirit man. Right. The word is the Hebrew word ish, right? Which yes. means the spirit of God, mm -hmm. right? So what I've come to understand from the scripture is actually man was never created. The misunderstanding is the Hebrew word, or no, the English the word English. created man. God created the body, which is the male, but he never created the man. Man was never created as God was never created. Because if the man was created, then that means God was created because the man was the, the spirit, spirit of God. Of God. Right, so then when he says he, the scripture always says she, uh, she came from his rib. That's not true, right? Yeah. But the word misunderstanding is the word rib. It means she came out of him. It was just a, another spirit that she, he had to pull out, but then had to form that spirit and give it a different body to call it a woman, mm -hmm. right? So the woman was not made from the rib of Adam. Because actually the Bible says he named both of them Adam. Adam. Right? So the woman came from the inner man, right? Yes. He went inside and brought out just another man. Uh, yes. And You're then right. formed that and, and gave it a body and name. Call womb it. to it and call it a womb Call womb it a womb man. man, yes. So, um, yes, the, the male body was created from the dust. The male body was created from the dust. But the man himself was never created. And the woman was never created either. That's the call from that dust called a humus. That's yeah. why it's called a human from the dust. You did get that? Okay. I mean, he have a good um, you know, um, explanation for it. Because the, the man, spirit man, and then the body, we are like in an earthly suit. This is the dust suit that man is dwelling inside. And like he explained, he took it from the inside, the man, and brought out another spirit of man. You see, the word there, we are going into, one of them here in English, you see, formed, the other one say created, the other one say fashioned. It's different things, you know, when you look at the Hebrew words that form uh, those words. So, glad you got that. Thank you so much for uh, bringing that to the now um what was i saying i think i've lost where i was okay yes he put the man so i'm talking about the male and the rest and, and and the criteria you have to find yourself fulfilled before looking for or if you already have and then we're talking about some of the qualities of a good gardener uh this side have not given me anything concerning uh being a good gardener and it, you will know how to control pests. That's a good thing. Because there are so many things that comes as a pest. Gossips comes as a pest to the woman. Okay? Her friends that may have been divorced or having problems begins to feed her with some information that may not be necessary for the growth of your own relationship. So you know how to control those pests. Thank you. What else? Know when to sow and when to harvest. Thank you. Go ahead. You have so much. <laughs> Give him the mic so they can. <laughs> Envy of your neighbor's garden. Envy of it. Can you help us how you have to know that in order for you to get into your relationship? In putting all this together with a gardener, you're dealing with pests, you're having patience, you're planting things. You may not see, and you talked about uh, you won't be able to reap what you sow in one day. You may look at your neighbor's garden and see results. You don't know how long they've been cultivating and putting in work, and you're looking at yours like, well, when is mine 
going to start looking like theirs? When is mine going to turn green? When am I going to see growth? You can't look at your neighbor in that form or fashion. Stay with what you're doing, what God has you called to do. Same thing in your relationship. I like that. I like that. You don't have to look at your neighbor's this thing to see because you don't know what much they put into it. You know, because it's like, um, uh, uh, buy some books. If you look at the cookbooks, in this way, pictures of the finished product. On the left side, it shows you the recipe. But we never go through the recipe. We want to get the finished product. So that's exactly what he's saying. What else? And then we'll do it next. The seeking out the right, seeking out the right help. I love that so much because many times we have challenges in our relationship, and the people will go to to seek help. Um, you know, if you look at the somebody gave a testimony sometime in the past that a professor of his came into the class to teach on how to be a millionaire, and that when he came outside looking at the professor, he came with a v, a vehicle that people had to push. The vehicle. And then he said, How can I be this man? You're right. You need to go out how to do. So see from so many people. First you have to look at what is the life of what is the life of the person you're seeking help with? What is the kind of with his own relationship? Because you cannot teach what you don't know. Neither can you give what you don't have. And many times we go to uh, people who teach us or who help us as counselors themselves have been married four or five times. So what does he or she has to give you is follow my words and not my speech. But when you follow the principles of the kingdom, the life of the teacher must reflect what the teacher is teaching. In that way, Jesus began to do and to teach. It is his life that he translated into what he taught. Next, he put Adam in the garden. He told him to tend. He told him to cultivate. He told him to serve. He told him to protect. Many times, they, you have to learn how to protect that garden. Even when you think the garden is not giving you the expected result. And I see people who are ardent gardeners. At the end of all their efforts, they did not get the expected yield. But they are still so passionate, waiting to start a new garden. Many times in our lives and our relationship, the things we were expecting did not come out the way that we had expected it. And what happened? We want to call it quit. Or we turn around the women you are supposed the protecting, you become the terror. You become the nightmare instead of being the protector of the garden. He told Adam to protect the garden. He said, he put Adam in the garden for him to tend and to serve. And I think I was just giving a sign that your lunch is ready. And it's almost one o'clock. I'll give you one more point. So take one minute before you go. For the next point after he put Adam in the garden there, told him to tend the garden. The next thing there is give Adam his word. He said, of every tree in the garden you are free to eat. He gave Adam his word. Do you have the word? The essence to Adam because when the woman comes, Adam should be able to be the teacher of the word. If your wife has more word or your about the true word of God more than you, you are in a problem. It for your before you The garden become all right. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, quickly before we go for lunch, um, 
when you were introducing uh, this session, you mentioned uh, something about uh, making the right choice. Yes. At the beginning. Yes. So my question is, how do we make sure that the choice that we are making is the right choice, number one? Number, sure. two, number two, you also mentioned that um, the perfect woman is only in your mind, right? So if you believe that the perfect woman is only in your mind, so when it comes the time for you to uh, make that choice, w w I mean, are you choosing between a perfect, among perfect <laughs> and <laughs> imperfect women? Or okay. how, how does it happen? I love that question. Thank you so much for the, the question. Number one, your first question says, um, what's the question again? The first question you asked about um, how do you know? Now, here is one of the challenges people do have. And that challenge is they are looking for three-step solutions. As you come to the understanding, I begin to talk about the biblical principles and the concepts of relationship that God has established that you must first be in. The very first one we talked about what was what? The presence of God. We talked about the presence of God. That's number one. Number two, we talked about you obtaining the skills, but when he told Adam, put Adam in the garden to tend, I said the world is a complicated word, also means to become. Now, if you look at everything that entails in that area, when, I, when you are to learn how to become, learning the tools, the skills, that is required and you are in the presence of God. And thirdly, we talked about you receiving that word. That word that has the ability and the power to bring transformation. When you are receiving these things, at the end of the day, by the time you get to you making a choice, you're going to realize one thing. What is in you will either repel or attract the right person. What is in you will repel people. What is in you will attract the right person. If you what is built in you, I can give you my own personal example. When God was able to build in certain things in me, it changed my life and I had certain conditionalities before I get married. That any woman and that the woman I make an attempt for sexual relationship, even though I know it was intentional and she agrees to it, immediately I know it is a no-no. Because if you believe you're a true believer in Christ, that's my personal. If you believe you're a true believer in Christ and you understand the principles of the kingdom, I should not go into fornication. That's number one for me. And being able to allow God to imbue some things in me. Many people that I had opportunity to meet, many that wanted sex, and I knew that was contrary to my principle. It repelled them from me. And the ones that were attracted to me were those who also have the same principle. So if you're an iron and a magnet can only magnet what? A metal. A magnet does not magnet carpet. It does not get glue to the wall. If you're a metal, you'll be attracted to a metal. So in having this Things we are going through now. We've already gone through three of them. We are dealing now with those principles and those laws you have to be a part of to understand that when they follow in you, we'll get to the point of the choice when we get to verse 24, okay? We'll get to that 24. You begin to see the culmination of these principles, what kind of choice it will get to. You will know that. And then so our second question was, I said the perfect wife it's in your head. What I mean that the perfect wife is in your head. Remember I said earlier also that what makes you successful in a relationship is already imbued in you. You remember that? I accept you were not here earlier. I said what makes a relation successful in a relationship is already in us. It's imbued. I gave an example of vehicle. The audiometer, the speed that the vehicle can go, but where it's limited. How he washed the church 
by, you know, with water by the word, how he cleansed the church, how he did everything to bring the church to where he wants it to be and presented the church to himself. You can take the same woman that you, if you're already there with the woman, if you're not there with the woman and you know that this person, we're going to come to one critical point that will answer that question completely. Just hold your thoughts on that place. Push a pause button. Don't go beyond that place. Keep the dial on. After lunch, we will explain one more, couple of more things that will help you in making the right choice. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you.